Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with New Orleans-based pianist Oscar Rossignoli. He opened up about his first recording as a leader called Inertia out in 2021. He is a native of Honduras and is very accomplished in both jazz and classical music. He began studying classical music when he was six years old and discovered jazz in high school. He then immediately began writing and performing his own compositions. Enjoy this story. Thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me, Vince. I want to talk to you a little bit about this new album of original compositions, Inertia. It's coming out during a time of a global pandemic and a lot of things going on on the planet. So first and foremost, what does it feel like? And also, too, there hasn't been a lot of interaction with the fans other than recorded music. How do you feel about this release? Uh, Joe, I'm very, very proud of it, Uh, not just because it has been a dream of mine, you know, uh, the iconic solo piano format. It's always a, a dream of mine to release an album of solo piano compositionally, but uh, yes, of course, 2020 was a very uh, difficult year for everybody, especially uh, musicians down here in New Orleans, because we lost all, all the work. So in a way, you know, it was interesting for me, like after a little bit, that kind of uh, helped me, like kind of pushed me forward to do this, because in the middle of this uncertainty, right? Like we didn't know what was going to happen, how long is, are we going to be without without our normal lives, you know? So I said, well, might as well do it, you know? If if I have to do something else for a living, if if, if live music is not a thing anymore, uh, well, let me at least do this. I have to do something, you know? 2020, I can't be just sitting around waiting. In the middle of, of this, this difficult times, um, I feel like, just being in that mental state kind of pushed me to go ahead and just do it. What did you learn about yourself over this time of quarantine and lockdown and not being able to perform live? What is it that will make you hopefully stronger as you reemerge? Well, I think one of the things that, and I've been talking with my friends and, and in the audience here in the music scene, one thing that we learn is how important it is to take time to rest. <laughs> Because, you know, it was a hard stop. Like, we were playing so much music and so many gigs every day and suddenly nothing. And after, you know, the initial panic and, like, what are we going to do? Oh, my God, my bills. But after a while, I was feeling like, oh, man, this is kind of nice on one side. Because now you you can focus on on what you really want to do, musically speaking, or, or, or start thinking in a different way. We recorded an album with another project that I'm involved with. It's a trio called Extended. And just being able to to have the time to meet weekly, you know, and, and just work on, on original compositions. And we just took our time with every piece. Like we would rehearse one or two pieces every rehearsal instead of like trying to get a set together, like two sets together, you know, in, in two rehearsals. So not being rushed to do anything kind of gave us the time, and, and it made me at least appreciate a little bit more the, the process of making music and like, hey, stop for a second, you know, like focusing more on things that are really interesting to me, not just uh, taking every gig I can, things like that, just like the value of stopping and, and taking a rest and, and just decompress. So you're a long way from your homeland of Honduras, and I'm curious, how did you get the jazz bug? How did the, the seeds get in you to become the musician you are? And it actually happened, I remember the moment exactly, because I grew up studying classical music since first grade, six, seven years old. I've been in schools where they're like specialized for music, right? That's the program we have in Honduras. But I remember one day I'm walking down the aisle, and my friends, my classmates were were in a practice room and they say, hey, Oscar, come check this out. And they had a recording. They were playing a CD of uh, Dominican pianist, uh, Michel Camilo, uh, who is, you know, his forte. He's a composer, but he also plays a lot of Latin jazz. His compositions are are, uh, strong in the Latin jazz, you know, uh, style. So that kind of, I said, oh, my God, I have to learn. What is this? You know, this is something new. I want to learn how to do this. Thing. And after that, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out the chords, the improvisations, the solo, 
transcribing uh, Michel Camilo's compositions, and that took me to improvisation, and you know, then it just unpacked this whole world of jazz. What was the first live jazz show that you ever saw, um, maybe either in Honduras or maybe when you got to the States that really made you think, man, I'd love to do that? We didn't have a strong jazz scene in Honduras back then when, when I was studying. Uh, but I remember that the U.S. Embassy would bring jazz quartets, quintets from the United States to play for us. So they would do master classes. And I remember the first time I saw that, uh, I just thought, man, this is what I want to do. And uh, it was interesting because the school was purely classical. And there they come, these guys, and they play this cool music, and they leave. And now we're like, man, I want to do that. Now what? <laughs> we, don't have a, we don't have a jazz program here. I had to, you know, listen, uh, learning by listening to the records. But, yeah, that was the first exposition to jazz. What musicians were you really listening to as you started getting into jazz that really kind of uh, inspired you or make you helped you find your voice and your way in the music? Pianists such as Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock, Keith Jarrett, Cuban pianist Gonzalo Rubalcaba uh, were the first big influences. And, and, of course, all Herbie's catalog of music led me to Miles Davis. And, and all the music that Miles created, of course. Uh, but yeah, those were my first uh, influences. How did you end up in New Orleans? How did, that, how did that happen? Was that a dream of yours to get to the United States? It was a dream of mine since, since early on. Uh, probably because some of my classmates in elementary school, they had siblings that were also musicians. And, and, I, and I would overhear then talk about them like yeah my my brother he's in let's say in Chicago he plays for the symphony orchestra so I would hear those stories and and and, and yeah early on I said well I want to do that I want to grow I want to be able to do this music thing the best way I can and my my parents always encouraged me to be you know the best to do the best to be better to practice um, all about excellence. So yeah, I always I started pursuing when the time came applications for schools, and uh, uh, that led me for some reason to Louisiana State University. I had a, a couple of friends, uh, former classmates that were studying there. They made the connections for me to uh, get my degree at Louisiana State University (LSU). Graduating after that, it was only no logical to made the move to New Orleans, which is an hour away from, from the university. So being in that historic, one of the original cradles of jazz as we know it in America, what was it like to go to one of your first shows and maybe Preservation Hall or, or, or any place there that has history? What did it feel like to actually watch that and see it unfold in New Orleans? It was so beautiful, man. It was so overwhelming, too. Just the energy of, of the city is just something I had never experienced before, of course. I listened to this music only by CDs, albums, videos, or the few bands that would come from, from the United States you know, to Honduras. So for me, it was just very exciting, very exciting, and, and, and get to meet all these people, too. Like, it started to getting gigs little by little and, and being exposed to this music and uh, very important also to 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 play with elders, you know, like they have passed along this this tradition uh, through generations. So learning the music from them is is just you know you cannot put a price to that. Speaking of being around big time musicians and you know learning from them, you played around quite a few in your life: Earl and Riley, Jason Marsalis and others like that, what have you learned from them that has helped you teach younger players that you're around? The, the, one of the things that I, I, I feel I've learned the most in New Orleans is how this music should feel. I was well-versed in, in, in the theory, you know, the, 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 the scales, the chords, and, and, and the repertoire, but um, playing with them and, and li learning how to listen and, and realizing that this is not about me, but it's about how we play music together, you know, uh, and, and just how they do it and how they do it without telling you, just by showing you, you know, that was, that was 
super special for me. Every day you get to wake up, you get to create music, you're a professional musician. What is the best part of that? The best part of that for me is it keeps it fresh, especially in a city like New Orleans. I feel like there's so many different kinds of music. The same person would play a traditional jazz gig, and at night would play a funk gig, you know. And later on the next day, some experimental free improvisation kind of music. So in this city, uh, you kind of navigate many, many styles. So I, there's no way you can get bored. You know, you, every project, like I have a, a couple of projects coming up, and it's totally different music. It's the repertoire of Ellis Marsalis, but then it's uh, funk or hip hop repertoire too, different different kinds of gigs, different kind of gear, different sounds, different people too, you know, so it's fresh every time. If you could get into a time machine and go back in time and you could see any gig of any jazz musician ever, who would you love to see live? I think, first of all, I would love to see Art Tatum play live because, you know, those recordings sound, sound unbelievable. Uh, so I would love to have seen Art Tatum play live. Secondly, I would say I would love to see, which is one of my favorite bands of all time, is the Miles Davis uh, second um, quintet with Herbie, Tony, uh, Tony Williams, Ron Carter, Wayne Shorter, you know. That's, that would be my dream gig to go see. You know, as the world starts to wake up now and live gigs start back up, what do you hope we all realize about this long time that we've been away from live music, both musician and the audience. We've seen already uh, what is happening, and I, I, I think people, and people, I mean audience and musicians, we are just more appreciative of, of what music is and what music can mean. Every gig that we, that we have right now, I feel like people are so open to listening and to just really, really search for what kind of message, you know, is in the music. Uh, there's some clubs here in New Orleans that used to be, you know, we play the music, people are talking and, and dancing or, or just having a good time. But it, it used to be like we were kind of like a background uh, 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 situation. And now people are just like quietly just like listening, really trying to connect with us. And that is very refreshing. Live music is just it's it's just coming back stronger than before. I feel in New Orleans. Why do you love jazz? Yeah, I love jazz because it allows me to put myself in a community. Like I can hear my own voice, but I can also hear my voice with my peers, with with this community of musicians. And not just in bands where I play, but anywhere. I can go to Italy tomorrow if I could and and sit in uh, anywhere if they're playing jazz. There's a good chance we all know the same repertoire or the same language, same vocabulary. So that ability to connect immediately uh, is something that I love. I really love. Something that probably is difficult to do a little bit, a little bit more with classical music, uh, but yeah, I love that. Beautiful. So everyone has an idea or a perception of who they think you are: your family, your friends, and your fans. But you're the one that's living your life. Who do you think you are? <laughs> Interesting <laughs> question. Diffi difficult question. I think I am so many things. I don't think that's. I cannot answer that with one. I am not one thing. I am everything. I am, I am the environment. I am the interactions. Like people see me in a way, of course, different perceptions and all of that. But I think we share, we are on the same experience of life. So I, I cannot be me without the others. Beautiful, man. Oscar, hey, thank you for opening up about the new album, the world of music and, and your life and music. I really appreciate it. Good luck with everything. Thank you, man. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Honduras, New Orleans, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Oscar for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends.
Neon Jazz.